Amen. Well, so I want to talk about, <clears throat> we're coming into the uh, Christmas season. So the question I have today for all of us here and for those that watch as well is, do you want to see Jesus? I mean, if, if you could really, wouldn't that be incredible I mean, if we could really just see him like face to face? But do you want to see Jesus in this season of your life, maybe in your family, maybe in your own individual life? <clears throat> I know I do. If I really am asking myself the question, do I want to see him? I do. I certainly do. Well, there's a story about a church in the downtown uh, Los Angeles. Has anybody here ever been to Los Angeles? Yes. Wow, more than what I would have thought. Man, almost over half of you. So my grandfather lived in, in uh, Los Angeles. And so... Um, I uh, <clears throat> I didn't really know him growing up, and as I got older, this would be my mom's dad. Uh, we wanted to have a relationship with him, and so he lived in East LA. And all the things you think about East LA is probably true. <laughs> and so uh, I had a friend of mine that I went to Bible college that also lived in Los Angeles. And so I graduated, he was back in Los Angeles as far as this friend of mine. And so I was gonna go visit him and I was gonna to go to a, to a conference with him and spend some time. At the same time, I wanted to, to reconnect with my grandfather. So I contacted my, my grandfather and, and again, this would have been the first time he and I would ever meet and I was probably in my early 20s or so. And so uh, sure enough, he said that would be fine and so I flew into to LAX, Los Angeles Airport, uh, spent some time with this friend of mine, and then I borrowed his vehicle. And he said that, uh, you know, back then it wasn't the way it is now. You have everything on your, your phone as far as directions. But uh, so I was going to have to tra travel quite a ways in Los Angeles. And if you've ever been to Los Angeles and if you've ever driven in Los Angeles, not just like from one neighborhood to the next, but I mean city to city within these suburbs of Los Angeles. I mean, you're talking about high alert as you're driving. And so he gave me some advice. He said, one more thing, just make sure you lock your doors. I said, okay, I'll make sure I do that. And so, yeah, Los Angeles has some, some beautiful parts of, of, of Los Angeles, and then there's also the other parts that are not as nice. Well, there was a church that was started in downtown Los Angeles with one purpose in mind, and that was to reach people that didn't know Jesus. And that would be great if we had that same vision today, to, have, to establish churches just for the one purpose of reaching people for Christ. Well, this church was started in the early 1900s, and it was called the Church of the Open Door, the Church of the Open Door. And it was appropriately located on a street called Hope Street. So if you were looking for it, it was the name of the, the street was Hope Street. One of the pastors of the church, many of you would be familiar with him, and that's the late uh, Vernon uh, McGee, and, and he's a phenomenal Bible teacher. I'd highly recommend any of his teachings. So he pastored that church for a good, good time in that, during that time period. But if you ever went to that church, one thing you would notice, it was a very large church. We have a balcony here, and, and there have been times we've had special services here where the balcony has been full, and, and obviously, you know, down here. And it's, it's quite a sight when you're on this side to see that many people. Well, there they would have, they had the main floor, and then they had a balcony. And in addition, they had a second balcony. And it was a very large church. But interestingly enough is if you ever were a speaker at that church, it would be one thing to look out and you would see, wow, look at how many people are here. But they had a little plaque that was right on the podium, right on the pulpit. And it said these words, sir, we wish to see Jesus. In other words, it was to keep people in, that's a Bible verse and we'll read it here in a little bit, but that was to keep people in check. Those that were going to share that it's not about you. <laughs> And it's not about anything other than letting people see Jesus. And that was the whole theme of that church. If you ever got sidetracked, it was a little plaque when you set your notes down, your iPad, whatever it was, there was going to be a reminder, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Well, that's taken from a passage in John chapter 12 and verse number 20 and 21. 
Let's read that, those passages. It says, now there were certain Greeks among those who came to worship at the feast, which would have been the feast of Passover. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and they asked him this question, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. In this season of what we call Advent, Christmas season, you're going to hear a lot about Christmas. In, the, in different ways, you know, we had the whole Black Friday and then you have all the things, you know, that happens on Monday and all your, the various ads. And uh, I think my kids think I'm paranoid sometimes because I feel like they're tracking you, right? I mean, ironically, you'll walk somewhere and you'll, you'll mention JCPenney and all of a sudden it's on your phone on an ad. They think I'm a little paranoid with those things. And so... But you're going to get a lot of ads. You're going to see a lot of things that people post, maybe about the pictures of them and they gathered for Christmas or that they traveled to, you know, so-and-so place. Maybe Sarah and I need to get some more social media because we kind of find out after the fact and people already know about whatever because of social media. You'll find out all the various news of where people are going and where they're traveling and who was there and who came and who went and, and all those things. We're going to hear that in the next couple of weeks. So in this busy time, are you in a position where you can actually see Jesus and all the things that are going to happen? Because it's like, wow, this season, once it kicks in, not this it's usually not quite yet. This is kind of the weekend people travel. They, they're either traveling here or they're traveling somewhere else. But man, starting this coming week, it, it's, it's like, here we go. And for the next so many weeks, we're all going to be very busy, busy with Christmas parties, with all the things that we're going to do, the decorating and the time that we're going to enjoy with our family. Are you in a position to see Jesus? What if for this entire month of December that's coming up, if you put it as your mission, sir, I wish to see Jesus. What if that was your theme for this coming month? I like that. I do too. What if it was your theme for this coming year in 2023 that I want to see Jesus? I want to see him in, in so many ways, whether it's at work in my own life or my children or in someone else's life. But I want to see Jesus. Hallelujah. Are you in a position, in a place where you can see Jesus in this season of your life? So today I want to look at two, two individuals, well, shepherds, so it's plural, and also the wise men, but these two distinct groups of people that got to see Jesus. And I want to learn from them of how we can also see Jesus. So at the birth of Christ and at the early time of Christ, there were those who were positioned to see Jesus. They were at the right place, at the right time, at the right moment to be in a place to see Jesus. Turn with me to Luke chapter number 2, verse number 9. Luke 2 and verse number 9. <clears throat> It says, And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Hallelujah. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace goodwill towards men so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us and they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. 
what can we learn from the shepherds? What's interesting about the story is it doesn't say that they were seeking him. They were just tending their, their flock, the sheep. It would be as if you're kind of minding your own business, doing life, doing your profession, whatever it is that you're doing. And then all of a sudden, you had a heavily visitation from the Lord and he gave you these instructions. But then they had to do their part. What would you do if God said he came to you and he said, this is what you need to do? It's interesting their response. They said, let us go now. Let us go with haste. In other words, let us, let's don't delay. And I think that oftentimes, especially in American Christianity, I think for the most part or from in, in most cases, I mean, think the, the, the person that's seeking God, they really are seeking God. But what do you do whenever God speaks to you and he says, this is what I want you to do. Let's say you've been praying about something with your family or that happens a lot of times. Let's just say it's, it's maybe a person that God is saying, you know, you've been at odds with this family member, right? And you haven't talked for a while, but I want you to initiate it. Don't wait on them because they're not going to do it. You initiate. You initiate that, that establishing, that reestablishing of the relationship of, of forgiveness. And so he comes and speaks to you. And I think you hear the voice of God. You sense the voice of God. You, you, you perceive it. You feel it. You, you believe it's God speaking to you. But are you going with haste? Are you, are you, are you doing it? Are you delaying your obedience? Are you, are you waiting? Are you, are, you, are you waiting too long when God says to do something? And I think that that's where a lot of us find ourselves oftentimes. It's, it's we're, we're, we're going to take the step, but you know, God spoke, but everything has to be first in place before we actually take those steps. And it says, with them, they came. They said, let us now go. Let us do it right now. Let's don't delay let's don't wait let's don't prolong it let's don't wait a couple of weeks a couple of months a couple of years let us now go like right at this moment and so they did and then they went with haste and then they found Jesus delayed obedience is not obedience I like what someone said I mean it's it's it, it, it's so profound she says, this is Christina Rossetti, she said, postponed obedience can never bring us to the full blessing of God or the blessing that God intended or what it would have brought had we obeyed at the earliest possible moment. Obedience is the fruit of faith. Patience is the early blossom on the tree of faith. It's very profound. In other words, if you want to see Jesus in this season, Come without delay. Don't postpone your obedience for another day. Don't say, well, whenever I get everything right, then I'm going to obey. Whenever I put it all together, then I'm going I'm to do what God says for me to do. So if you want to see Jesus, then you have to position yourself and come without haste. It's interesting in the Old Testament, but God came to Abraham in Genesis chapter number 17. Abraham is 99 years of age at this point. And God had already spoke to him what he was going to do. It's called the Abrahamic covenant. And that was in what Genesis chapter 12, but now we're in 17 and it still hasn't happened yet. And God asked him to do one thing. He reminds me. He says, now I'm going to change your name from Abram to Abraham. That's what this chapter talks about. He says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make you, I'm going to, I'm going to increase and multiply your, your seed. And you're going to have generations that are going to come from you. You're going to be blessed. There's only one thing I'm going to require of you. That's it. You know, God's going to do hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of things from the seed God, God's going to do it. He's going to do something incredible. And all he's requiring for, from Abram that becomes Abraham is just one thing. He says, you just got to go circumcise yourself. That's it. Just one thing. He says, circumcise yourself. Go circumcise your, your, your household. And that's all I'm requiring. And if you look at the passages in Genesis chapter number 17 and verses 23 and 26, it says, on that very day, Abraham... 
It was at that moment, I mean, that he obeyed God on that very day. And then in verse 26, it says the same thing, that they were both circumcised on that very day. Obedience is important to fulfilling the promises of God. Amen. What about the wise men? What can we learn? They, they position themselves to see Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter number 2 and verse number 1 and 2, and then we'll look at verse 10. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men came from the east, or wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. Verse number 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. See, the wise men came with expectancy. I love this statement. Somebody said it this way, that expectancy is the breeding ground for miracles. In other words, if you're if people that expect God to do something, it literally is the breeding ground for the miraculous to take place in your life. In their expectancy, they saw Jesus. Are you expecting to see the Lord in this season of your life? Are you expecting him to do something in your family, in your own life? What's interesting is the wise men were worshipers. The worshipers will position themselves to see Jesus. And this is how their worship looked. In Matthew 2.11, it says... When they had come into the house, they saw the young child. They fell down and worshipped him. Amen. A worshiper will always see Jesus. The highest place you can ever get in God is at his feet. Amen. You will always see him when you worship at his feet. There are three things that these wise men brought, three gifts. The first one is gold. You can write this down. Gold represents the price of my worship. Amen. The price of my worship. In other words, worship is, is very costly. It, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you time to worship. It's going to cost you a commitment. You've got to clear your schedule, your calendar to worship him. It's going to, really, it's going to cost you, if you really want to know, like to get to the very root of it, it's going to cost you a surrendered life where you surrender your life wholeheartedly, not a part of you, not parts of you, but a wholehearted surrender. In that scripture that we started with, that says John 12, uh, 21, sir, that they would love to see Jesus. It says we would like to see Jesus. And then in verse 22, as you continue reading the, the story, it says, Philip went to tell Andrew, this is in John chapter 12 and verse 22. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and, and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it. For eternal life, whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. If you made a decision to serve the Lord, to follow him, regardless of what you're going to go through in your life. The Bible says this, that in this life, in this world, it's John 16, 33 Josh, if you can put that up, the NIV version. It says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. John 16, 33. In this world, you might have trouble. It doesn't say might, does it? It doesn't even say you, you may. It says you will have trouble. In this life, you will have trouble. But then he continues on. He says, but take heart. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. 
Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Sometimes it's between the yes and the amen that we find ourselves in the trouble, right? You know, God's promises are yes and amen, but sometimes we're right in the middle of that. Have you made a determination that no matter what happens in your life, that you're going to follow Christ? That no matter the circumstance, the difficulties that will come, no matter what, maybe it's your children that they'll go through, or your grandchildren, or your husband, or your wife, or your parents, that no matter what happens in this life that you have determined to follow Christ. You have to make that. It's like that's where relationship begins. You have to establish the relationship. You know, I made a commitment to my wife until death do us part. I made that commitment. And so with my whole heart, I'm going to follow that commitment. So with Christ, when you have to, you, you, you come to that relationship with the Lord, you have to make a determination. No matter what happens in this life, I have determined to follow you. Because he says it, sir, we wish to see Jesus. So they go, one tells one and the other one tells the other one. Then they finally gets to Jesus and then Jesus gives this parable. You think, well, how does this answer the question? You thought he would, you would have thought he would say, okay, well, you know, right now we're going to have a healing service and then after that I'll be glad to see them. And you would have thought he would have answered their question that way. Instead, he gives them a parable to answer the question whether or not these Greeks can see him. What he's saying is, you have to die. You have to give your life. You have to surrender. It has to be wholehearted. It has to be not just a party. It has to be every part of you. When you surrender your life, you will see Jesus. It's a wholehearted commitment. No matter what trials you face in this life. So the gold, whenever these wise men are offering the gold, it's the price of my worship. Because they were worshipers. It's, it's the cost of my worship. 1 Peter 1, verse 6 and 7 says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. No matter what trial you face, it's like gold that's being in, tried in the fire. It's being refined. Your heart, your life is being refined. Those opportunities to be tested in your life. So if you continue on in your faith, don't give up. You will see Jesus. The second thing they offered him was frankincense. The first one was the gold, which is the price of your worship. Frankincense is the purity of your worship. The purity of your worship. In other words, there's no pretension. You're not pretending to know Jesus. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people pretend that they, that they know him, but they don't really know him. I mean, they can, they can describe him, but they don't know him. They can tell me about him, but they don't know him. Frankincense is, uh, comes from this resin from a tree, and this is what, how they get it. They, they take the certain kind of tree, and then they cut it at the trunk. It's an, an incision is made. It's cut. And then over time, the various things happen to, to actually get this, the resin and to get frankincense from that. But it's at the trunk of the tree. See, true and genuine worship comes at the foot of the tree or the foot of the cross. No matter how long you serve Jesus, this is the place you'll always see him is at the foot of the cross. That's where it keeps you in check with everything, humility, with patience, with love. Any, the fruit of the Spirit, anything you can think of, it's always at the foot of Christ, always. Forgiveness, mercy, Everything, all of Christianity is based right there. That's why Paul said, I only, I'm, I'm going to preach Christ. I'm going to preach Christ crucified. It's, it's a foundation. It's, it, it keeps you in check in life for the rest of your life is to be at the foot of the cross. That's the frankincense. It's the purity of my worship. It's no pretense. I'm not up on a stage to perform. I, I, it's not about lights. It's not about you know anything other than um, I, it's just 
an overflow of my own relationship with Christ that I find him. I will always find Jesus. If I want to see him, I will always find him at the foot of the cross. It, 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 it takes humility. It takes me humbling myself. It's, it's, it's coming down to that place where it, it's all about him. It's an interesting story in the Bible that we read and we pretty much most of us here have heard about the woman with the alabaster jar and she breaks it. And it's found in, in various uh, passages in the Bible in Luke chapter 7 and Mark chapter 14 and John chapter 12. And this is what's interesting is that in Luke chapter 7, we'll, we'll read this passage in verse 36. It says, Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume and she stood behind him at his, at his feet and she was weeping and she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them and poured perfume on them. What a moment. We I mean, talking about broken, broken at the feet of Jesus. When the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he begins to say to himself, this man was a prophet. He would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. He says, tell me, teacher. He begins to tell them about two men that owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 dinar and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, well, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. Jesus said, well, you judged correctly. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. She didn't give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guest began to say amongst themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Let's look at another facet or angle of the story and that's in Mark chapter 14 he gives us some more insight about the same story Mark 14 verses 3 and 5 3 through 3 through 5 it says while he was in Bethany reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper a woman came with an alabaster jar a very expensive perfume made of pure nard she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head some of, those, some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Who do you think those were? Who do you think the people were that were the ones asking the question, saying why, why this waste of perfume? Who do you think those... Who do you think that was? Who do you think was asking the question that it could have been sold for more than a year's wages? Any idea? Well, let's, the Bible has the answer. So we, there was more than one, but for sure we know one for sure. And that's in John chapter 12 and verse number four. Same, same story. It says, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, ob objected, saying, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money back, so he was also the treasurer, he used, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for my day, for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. 
There's so much here. So you have the purity. Frankincense is the purity of worship. Interestingly enough, Judas, his name, the reason it's Judas is scary because it was more than one Judas, but it comes from the word Judah. And Judah means praise. And if there's anything about Judas, it's this. It's a praise that betrays. In other words, we have a lot of people in Christian circles, that's why it's without pretense, that are pretending to know Jesus, but they have a praise that betrays. They were critical of her. He was critical of her worship. One thing I've learned is never criticize somebody's worship. If they don't worship like you do, don't, don't criticize. We don't know what is happening in their heart. You don't know. We're all different. We have various backgrounds. Some people cry and they weep and they feel the presence of God and there was a friend of mine he was a wrestler for Ohio State and I was telling Pastor Lou a couple weeks ago but this guy was he wasn't very tall he was like 5'5 five, five, but I mean he was built and, and so he had an encounter uh, with Jesus whenever he was in his senior year at Ohio State he was wrestling for them in fact there was a story where we were there was four of us we were all roommates and, and he lived uh, kind of in not far from Ohio State but we had this plan. We were gonna, we were all gonna jump him and take him down. So two, two of them were gonna grab his legs, and then I was gonna jump on top of him, and another guy was gonna get him from the front. And so his name is Sean, Sean Kinley. So sure enough, we we jumped him like that. And I jumped on his back, and he just flipped me over. And the other two, and he's laughing the whole time. And and of course, he ended up winning like it was nothing. But what's interesting about Sean is he was raised as a Catholic, and but God got a hold of his heart. And so his senior year, he, was, he got his degree at Ohio State, but then he also was attending this Bible college that I attended and because he had just become a follower of Christ. And we went to a very large church. It was, I don't know, seven or 8,000 uh, members. And so there would be times Sean would just take off running and he would just run around that whole church and people are cheering because it was exciting because that's what God was doing in his life. And so maybe that's you just want to take off running and that, you know, my wife is an like energetic cheerleader and she gets up and it's like, man, there's an excitement. And, and maybe for you, it's, it's more, you know, sitting down, it's just kneeling down, it's just this encounter and you're more quiet and, and but don't criticize somebody's worship because you never know what God is doing in their heart you never know and their own expression with to the Lord and for the Lord and so with with Judas he's a praise that betrays I mean here's a woman that is it's a purity of her worship it's in tears and 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 she's crying and it doesn't look pretty and it doesn't look formal and it doesn't look the way we think it doesn't fit in our box of praise and worship and yet in that same passage, you have somebody that's criticizing her worship and his name means praise. And yet he has a praise that betrays because there's not a purity in his worship. There's not, not that frankincense that's been cut at the very tree, at the very basin. That's where she found herself at his feet, at the feet of Jesus. That's why I said the highest place you can get in God is at the feet of Christ. So worshipers will always see Jesus. The final one is the myrrh. Myrrh is, it's also cut. It's a tree that has been cut. But unlike the frankincense that's cut at the very base of the tree, myrrh is, to quote uh, this article, myrrh is harvested by repeatedly wounding the tree in order for it to bleed. And then it'll eventually produce the myrrh. repeatedly wounded this is what I've seen with the Lord there's something about a broken and a contrite spirit the Bible says in Psalms 34 18 it says the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit Psalms 147.3, he heals the brokenhearted, he binds up their wounds. Psalms 46.1 and 2, God is our refuge and strength, the very present 